Follow the rise of Osama bin Laden and watch how a government rivalry between the FBI and the CIA impacted the tragic 9-11 attacks on Hulu's new original series, The Looming Tower. The Looming Tower is available now, only on Hulu. You should also check out a new podcast, Breach. Breach is not a ParCast podcast, but they have excellent in-depth research and captivating storytelling like we do on cults. They set out to answer questions about the hack of a huge American company and found themselves investigating a Russian conspiracy. Subscribe to Breach, B-R-E-A-C-H, in your podcast app right now. Listener discretion is advised. This episode includes discussions of suicide and abortion that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for children under 13. Hi, I'm Greg Polson. And I'm Vanessa Richardson. And this is Cults. Today, we're going to delve into the story of Chris Corda, the founder of the Church of Euthanasia, a United States-based cult that began in Massachusetts in 1992 and had around 200 core members, with as many as a thousand more who followed the church through the internet. The now inactive church's mission was to lessen the impact of overpopulation on the earth. Its only commandment was, thou shalt not procreate. The church advocated suicide as one of the most ethically responsible actions a person could take to solve the earth's overpopulation problem and provided explicit instructions on how to commit suicide, which led to at least one person taking their own life. In the first part of our two-part episode, we'll focus on Corda herself, her life, her beliefs, and the factors that might have motivated her to found the Church of Euthanasia. In part two, we'll broaden our focus from Corda to the Church of Euthanasia. We'll learn about the types of people who join the cult, the elaborate publicity stunts they orchestrated, and the uncertainty surrounding whether or not the church was a genuine cult. Some have argued that it was little more than a social consciousness movement, a group whose goal was to increase public awareness of a specific issue. The Church of Euthanasia may have existed solely to stage a series of demonstrations over more than 10 years, with the goal of using shocking images and ideas to increase public awareness of overpopulation and ecological destruction. If you want to listen to any previous episodes of Cults, you can find them on Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify, or on our website, parcast.com, spelled P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com. Don't forget to subscribe while you're there, because a new episode comes out every Tuesday. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram, at Parcast, and on Twitter, at Parcast Network. But for now, let's turn our attention to our first episode covering the Church of Euthanasia. In this installment, Chris Corda will be our primary focus. Chris Corda, a musician and software developer, founded the Church of Euthanasia in 1992. She has stated that the inspiration to do so came from a dream in which an alien intelligence she called the being warned her that the Earth's ecosystem was failing due to humanity's overpopulation and negligence. But before we discuss the Church, let's examine Corda's background. We want to note at the outset that Corda was designated male at birth and used male pronouns as a child and a teenager, then identified as female for a number of years. Since then, she has identified with both male and female pronouns. But because she identified as female in the most recent interview we were able to find with her from 2015, we'll be using female pronouns to refer to her throughout these episodes. Chris Corda was the only child of Michael Corda, a writer and editor, and Casey Corda, an aspiring actress. Michael came from an extremely wealthy family. His uncle, Sir Alexander Corda, was a prominent film producer and director, and Michael grew up in a well-heeled suburb of London in a home that overlooked Kensington Palace. Michael's parents, an art director and Broadway actress, respectively, sent him to an exclusive boarding school in Switzerland and then to Oxford, 
Michael wrote and published a variety of articles and books in the fields of film theory, history, and biography, and one of his books, Queenie, was adapted into a television miniseries. Michael also served as editor-in-chief of the publishing giant Simon & Schuster, a position he ascended to at just 33 years old. Chris Corda was born in New York City in 1962 and grew up in a spacious five-bedroom apartment in Manhattan. She attended the prestigious Grace Church School from kindergarten through eighth grade. A sensitive, bookish child, she did not have many friends in school and was somewhat of a loner. Corda had an interest in music and learned to play the piano and guitar. She studied rock and jazz as well as music theory. At some point in her childhood, Corda began to learn about the problem of ecological damage to the earth and its potential consequences, which caused her to begin fearing for the planet. In a 2013 interview, she cited reading a single New York Times headline about the possible irreversibility of global climate change as the catalyst that eventually led her to found the church. Corda claimed she was just 10 years old when she saw that headline. Corda maintains that throughout her childhood, she saw the world from an unusual perspective. She would look at a subway car filled with people and would suddenly see them as just a species of animals. From a very early age, she was contemptuous of humanity and fearful of what humans' continued existence might do to the earth. Vanessa is going to take over on the psychology here and throughout the episode. Please note, Vanessa is not a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist, but she's done a lot of research for the show. Thanks, Greg. So let's look into how it's possible that reading a single headline at the age of 10 could affect Corda so deeply. In the 1970s, when Corda was growing up and becoming more aware of the world, public awareness of issues like water and air pollution, as well as habitat destruction and ecological damage, was increasing rapidly. This newfound awareness of environmental issues led to legislation like the Clean Air Act and the Endangered Species Act. At the same time, the scientific community was beginning to publish articles about the dangers of carbon emissions and the greenhouse effect. So this increase of public awareness about global climate change during Corda's formative years may have exacerbated her fear that the Earth was in imminent danger. Exactly. And it's possible that at a young age, Corda was exposed to enough information about the potential of climate change that she developed a phobia or a fear that was extreme enough to affect her daily life and behavior about the Earth's future. It's not unusual for children to develop severe and specific fears that may seem irrational to adults. According to the American Psychiatric Association, around 5% of children and 15% of adolescents experience phobias. It seems like most people usually outgrow their phobias to some extent. Yes, it becomes much easier for most people to cope with fears using logic and reasoning as they mature. But a small percentage of childhood phobia sufferers continue to be affected by early fears well into adulthood. A University of Michigan study that looked into the lasting effects of childhood phobias found that about 18% of adult study participants attributed lasting anxiety and profound fears of dying to these fears experienced early in life. Corda's fears of global warming and irreparable damage to the environment were reinforced throughout her childhood and adolescence by scientific writing, the media, and growing public awareness. Given all these factors, it's possible that her fears didn't diminish, but rather grew and colored her perception of the world around her. So the fear Corda started to feel because of a New York Times headline she read when she was 10 years old could potentially have had enough of an impact to make her see groups of adults as animals. It's important to keep in mind that this is based on Corda's recollection of her own childhood, which she described in somewhat dramatic terms, at least partially so as to demonstrate how committed she always was to the Church of Euthanasia's cause. So we can't objectively know whether Corda actually harbored this level of fear and awareness for the Earth from such a young age. Right. But... Ultimately, while it's easy to feel afraid and helpless when faced with an issue as enormous as the Earth's climate, the fact is that most people who are concerned about climate change don't allow that fear to affect their lives and behaviors to this great an extent. Corda's response to this fear went far beyond being an eco-conscious citizen. For someone who is increasingly afraid that the Earth was overloaded with too many people, New York City might not have been the best place to grow up. 
By the time Corda's parents divorced in 1976, when she was 14 years old, Corda was sick of New York City and desperately wanted to leave. She enrolled at St. Paul's School, a boarding school in Concord, New Hampshire, but she was expelled after six months for smoking marijuana. After attending a series of private schools, Corda enrolled at Sarah Lawrence College in 1980, where she studied for a year. She then transferred to Berklee College of Music in Boston in 1981, but dropped out after a month and began working as a freelance computer programmer. Corda's friends described her as reclusive and grumpy, only emerging from her apartment to pursue her passion for music. She played in a swing band, a fusion band, and a psychedelic rock band, while also working as a street musician and teaching at a small music school. She also began experimenting with cross-dressing, and soon started identifying as a transgender woman. During this time, Corda became increasingly disenchanted with mainstream society. Now estranged from her parents, she resented and distanced herself from her family's wealth. She also denounced America's increasingly consumerist culture, as well as what she viewed as its vanishing diversity. Just as humans were systematically destroying biodiversity of animal and plant species, she argued they were also destroying cultural diversity by encouraging and even forcing those with alternative traditions and beliefs to assimilate into mainstream culture. Corda was fascinated by Native American cultures and religions, especially the Hopi tribe, which she praised for its traditional belief in the power of dreams. She referred to the time that dream-focused traditions have become commonplace as the age of magic and lamented that it was now over due to the forced conformity with industrial culture. Corda feared that people with differing lifestyles and cultures were being replaced by standardized humans who only know shopping malls and discotheques. She viewed conforming with society as a tragedy, the result of multiple generations of brainwashing. As part of her dissatisfaction with modern society, Corda became drawn to the Dada art movement. This avant-garde movement was developed by artists such as Marcel Duchamp, Max Ernst, and Hugo Ball in the early 1900s in reaction to World War I, and the movement's name has whimsical meanings in several different languages. In Romanian, it meant yes, yes, while in French, it meant rocking horse, and in German, it signified foolish joy. The Dada art movement aimed to highlight what the artists who led it perceived as the absurdity of World War I and the senseless deaths of millions that had resulted. It mainly consisted of artists who rejected the logic of modern capitalist society and traditional art, instead expressing protest through absurdist and satirical paintings, sculptures, poems, and performances. Famous Dada art pieces include Duchamp's depiction of the Mona Lisa with a scribbled-on mustache and Ernst's surrealist painting Forest and Dove. The Dada movement lives on today in many absurdist internet memes and images. Dadaist artists set out to critique modern industrialist culture and events through creating shocking offensive pieces, a concept that became integral to the Church of Euthanasia. Corda later cited the Dada movement as a guiding force of the church's ideology and methods. Like the Dada artists of old, Corda wanted to use absurd messaging and ideas to highlight the absurdity of ignoring the dangers facing the earth. She was willing to use shocking, offensive art in order to draw awareness to her movement. Corda's counterculturalist and misanthropic views were encouraged by Robert Kimberk, an older man whom Corda shared an apartment with in the 80s, when Corda was in her 20s. It's unclear how or when Corda and Kimberk first met, but what we do know is that Kimberk, an eccentric electrical technician, was no stranger to societal movements. He had been involved in a number of civil rights protests in the 60s. He was also a dedicated wildlife rehabilitator, which fell in line with Corda's anti-human, pro-animal ideology. Kimberg cheered Corda's anti-society leanings and eventually became one of the earliest members and leaders of the Church of Euthanasia, adopting the name Pastor Kim. Corda eventually moved out of Kimberg's apartment, so Kimberg could use Corda's bedroom as housing for a rescued seagull. In 1991, Corda moved to Provincetown, Massachusetts to pursue a career performing in drag shows. 
Provincetown was and is still known as a haven for artists, especially those in the LGBT plus community. But Corda felt rejected and alienated by other performers, calling them, quote, street divas who had nothing to fall back on but hooking or drug dealing. From what we've discussed, it seems that a common theme of Corda's early life was that from the start. She just never liked being around people all that much. It does seem surprising that someone who stated repeatedly that humans and industrialized society are ruining the world ended up choosing to lead a structured group of people. You'd think someone like that might prefer to live as a hermit or withdraw from society entirely. Hmm. However, Amanda Geyer, a psychologist at the National Institutes of Health, has found that many socially withdrawn individuals can actually be better than extroverts at noticing sensory cues and picking up on emotional subtleties. A surprising number of prominent figures today identify as introverted or socially withdrawn. For example, Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg are both self-described introverts. Even though Corda may have not liked people, she likely felt that it was her responsibility to put that aside in order to gather followers who would spread her message. It's also worth noting that many of the Church of Euthanasia's members participated in the cult via the Internet with smaller, scattered local events. So in the end, Corda didn't have all that much contact with the majority of her followers. Though she didn't feel welcomed by the Provincetown community, Corda did find an upside. For the first time, she was exposed to techno and electronic music. In the early 1990s, techno was still a relatively new genre, and Corda was enamored by it. She believed that techno was, by nature, apolitical, and that this made it a perfect platform for spreading counterculturalist messages. By June 1992, Corda had moved back from Provincetown to Somerville, Massachusetts, and was living in a house with four other people. One warm summer night, she had a dream in which she was confronted by an alien intelligence known as the Being, who she believed was speaking for Earth inhabitants from other dimensions. As soon as Corda woke up, she transcribed word for word what the Being had said to her. The message read, quote, Greetings. We are not of this planet. We do not understand your strange customs. Your planet's ecosystem is failing. Your leaders deny this. Explain. Why do your leaders lie to you? Why do so many of you believe these lies? Explain your strange customs. Why believe these lies? Save the planet. Kill yourself. Save the planet. Kill yourself. Save the planet. Kill yourself would soon become the slogan of the Church of Euthanasia. Time for today's recommendation. Brushing your teeth is one of the most important parts of your day. And surprisingly, most of us are brushing too hard or too quickly. Quip makes it effortless to brush just the right amount. Quip's slim toothbrushes have gentle vibrations and guiding pulses to alert you when to switch sides. And Quip is great for travel, too. The suction allows you to stick the brush to your mirror, and its mount also works as a toothbrush cover. Quip's subscription plan refreshes your brush every three months for only $5, plus free shipping. It's time to find out for yourself why Quip is backed by a network of dental professionals and was named one of Time Magazine's best inventions of the year. Quip starts at just $25. And if you go to getquip.com slash cults right now, you'll get your first refill pack free with a Quip electric toothbrush. That's your first refill pack free at getquip.com slash cults spelled G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash cults. Now here's something else we're excited to recommend. Greg and I love to do yoga to unwind after we record an intense episode of Cults. The easiest way for us to take classes together is with Yoga Glow. Yoga Glow makes it easy to do yoga and meditation anywhere by streaming right onto your phone, smartwatch, or computer. And for only $18 a month, you'll spend less than you would at one class at most traditional studios. You don't have to fight for parking or a spot for your mat on a packed studio floor. Yoga Glow's platform is simple to navigate, and with thousands of classes at all experience levels, you can easily find the perfect class for you. Their instructors include big names like Catherine Budig, 
Elena Brower, and Jason Crandall. Get your first two weeks of Yoga Glow free when you sign up on yogaglow.com slash cults. That's yoga, G-L-O, dot com slash cults for two weeks free. Yogaglow.com slash cults. Now, let's get back to the story. Chris Corda was inspired to found the Church of Euthanasia after dreaming about an alien being whose message was, save the planet, kill yourself. As Corda envisioned it, the group would be founded on the principles of anti-humanism, a nihilistic philosophical movement that emerged in the 1960s. Anti-humanism essentially states that humans have violated the natural order of biology, which is that a species can compete but cannot eliminate all competitors. Life on Earth, Corda argued, had been in an ideal state before humans rose to their position as the planet's dominant species. As a species, humans had no competitors or existential threats, and Corda believed this unbalanced the natural order. By the early 1990s, multiple researchers warned that the Earth was undergoing its sixth mass extinction event, the Holocene extinction. This meant that animal and plant species were going extinct at an unprecedented pace as a direct result of human activities. Corda felt that it was intolerable that the richness and diversity of life could end because of what she viewed as, quote, a ruthless and self-defeating species, end quote. She began reaching out to her friends in the artistic community to join her in bringing attention to the issue of overpopulation by any means necessary. At first, Corda did not have a large number of followers or publicity. The first ever event held by the church in June of 1992 was a counter-protest of a skinhead rally in Harvard Square and had very few participants. The next event, though, started to spur public awareness of the Church of Euthanasia. Corda was able to procure a pass to enter the floor of the Democratic National Convention on July 15, 1992, and passed out bumper stickers with the slogan, Save the Planet, Kill Yourself, to other attendees. This stunt caused a stir on the floor and angered many other convention goers, but Corda maintained that it was a satirical attempt to draw attention to her population awareness group the first of many times that she would switch from insisting that the church should be taken seriously to claiming that it was just satire. The convention stunt was written up in a local paper, the Daily News, which prompted interested people to begin trickling into the church. In 1993, Corda set up a rudimentary website for the church. She began using it to spread the word to like-minded artists and counterculturalists to see if they wanted to join her movement. These mostly consisted of activists and performance artists who were either concerned about the environment or wanted to be part of an attention-getting anti-establishment movement. Corda also began creating art that promoted the ideology of the church. The first of her techno CDs, titled Demons in My Head, was released in November of 1993 on the church's own record label, Kevorkian Records. Classified as dark ambient music, it was subtitled an environmental punishment in D minor, and featured the types of human sounds that disgusted Corda, such as toilets flushing, crowds panicking, and subway trains. It was not well received and is almost impossible to find now. Corda's follow-up single, Save the Planet, Kill Yourself, was released in April of 1994. Its lyrics were, verbatim, what Corda recalled the being saying in her dream. Like her previous music, this was widely panned by most non-church listeners. The majority of the church's recruiting and activities happen online, via chat rooms, news groups, and the church's website, which still exists today as an archive. Corda used the website to post updates and announce upcoming events, as well as to post her e-sermons, and to distribute the church's e-magazine, Snuff It, which had a total of four issues, the first which was sent out on June 1st, 1994. Corda felt that using the internet to spread the church's message was vitally important, as she believed that, quote, internet users were, by and large, highly educated members of the elite, and therefore very likely to be indoctrinated, end quote. In addition to the wide reach of the internet, Corda hoped that the shock value of the church's ideology would break through to those who she felt needed to hear her message the most. 
The group met secretly in a Somerville, Massachusetts building, using a basement space procured by one of the church's members. With a goal of making the church seem as legitimate a religious entity as possible, Corda structured the church hierarchy with herself titled reverend and other leaders designated as pastors and deacons. Pastors and deacons were typically men who had been with the church since its early days, such as Corda's former roommate, Robert Kimberk, who took on the name of Pastor Kim. Several female leaders in the church were titled sister, though the implementation of this was inconsistent. For example, Sister Catherine was prominent in the church and had been responsible for obtaining the basement space in which the church met. On the other hand, Lydia Eccles, another prominent female church member, was never referred to as Sister Lydia, while Nina Paley, another prominent member, was called Cardinal. It's unclear exactly what the requirements or responsibilities were for any of these positions. Throughout these first couple of years after the founding of the Church of Euthanasia, Corda began to solidify the church's foundational principles. Corda did not believe that the church should advocate for the total destruction of the earth through nuclear annihilation or some other catastrophe. The apocalypse would involve the destruction of the ecosystem, and that's what we're trying to prevent, she said in the June 1st, 1994 issue of Snuff It. Quote, there are many groups out there who support war, particularly nuclear war, as a way of drastically reducing or eliminating the human species. There is no doubt that the process would be effective, but it would also make vast areas of the Earth unsuitable for any form of life. What we're trying to do is put the human species back in balance with the other species on the planet. We're trying to prevent the apocalypse." End quote. Corda's goal was to restore balance between human and other species through convincing the human population to make permanent, voluntary changes to reduce itself. In a later New York Press interview, she said, quote, We must choose as a willful act of compassion to rejoin the web of other beings on the planet and become part of the living organism we call the Earth. That's what the Church of Euthanasia is trying to provoke, end quote. Though she was set on establishing the Church of Euthanasia as a formalized religion, with the being as its sole deity, Corda only had one ironclad commandment, quote, thou shall not procreate, end quote. In addition to that rule, over the first few years of the church's existence, Corda established the four main pillars of population reduction upon which the church was to be based, suicide, abortion, sodomy, and cannibalism. The immediate purpose of these pillars was to draw attention. They were shocking and attention-getting, and opened the door for church members to elaborate on why each of them was vital to helping solve the overpopulation problem. The four pillars became a beloved symbol for church members and looked like the Roman numeral three, but with an extra vertical line. Corda called this the church's version of the Christian cross symbol. She wanted it to be striking and instantly identifiable and to become as widely recognized as other common religious symbols. Corda and other church leaders would go on to get this symbol tattooed on themselves. In regard to the cannibalism pillar, Corda, a strict vegan, was not in favor of killing and eating other people. She was firm that all church followers and all people in general should be vegetarian or vegan. But if anyone couldn't bear to give up meat, human flesh taken from people who were already dead was a good alternative. In the New York Press interview, Corda said, quote, We have 60,000 auto accident fatalities a year. This is a total waste. That meat is getting buried in the ground. We're lucky if we get a couple of organs out of the deal. It should go straight to McDonald's, where the food is already so processed, I don't think anybody would notice the difference. It would be an excellent test case. It's no more obscene than people taking the flesh of other larger mammals directly into their bodies." End quote. Though Corda went so far as to post a guide to butchering human bodies on the Church of Euthanasia's website, no one associated with the group was ever actually recorded as practicing cannibalism from already dead bodies or otherwise. It's unclear whether the church was serious about cannibalism or whether this was just included in its messaging for shock value. Corda didn't officially advocate for murder, forced abortion or sterilization, or any other involuntary methods of population control. The abortion pillar signified that Corda strongly encouraged women to end their pregnancies. She criticized mainstream abortion activists for framing the act as a difficult and morally fraught decision, 
rather than what she viewed as the natural choice. Pro-choice is a euphemism that softens the message, she said in the 1996 New York Press interview. Quote, they have contributed to the perception that abortion is something bad and shameful. By not presenting it as something morally good, they have contributed to the erosion of Roe v. Wade. End quote. The sodomy pillar was not meant to promote rape or other non-consensual sexual acts, but rather to encourage people to engage in non-procreative sexual acts, rather than procreative sex. Cordes said, quote, You have license to do what thou wilt, whatever floats your boat, from foot fetishism to naked twister. You name it, we're for it. The one thing that church members could not do was decide to have children. Any members who reproduced, Corda said, would be excommunicated immediately. And then there was the foundational pillar of suicide, what the church was most notorious for encouraging to the world at large. The church was a strong proponent of legalizing voluntary euthanasia and threw its support behind Dr. Jack Kevorkian, a pathologist infamous for his pro-euthanasia stance and nicknamed Dr. Death. Dr. Kevorkian publicly advocated for terminally ill patients' right to die by physician-assisted suicide and claimed to have assisted more than 100 patients in ending their lives. But the church didn't stop at pushing for legal euthanasia for the terminally ill. It also encouraged those who were considering suicide to go through with it and posted detailed instructions for how to commit suicide on its website. However, it never experienced a mass suicide event something Corda expressed disappointment in on multiple occasions. Perhaps Corda worried that it would be hard for the church to be taken seriously if its members did not obey at least one of its main tenets. However, she never took any public steps to formally ask members of the church to end their lives together or to schedule any sort of group suicide event. In the Frequently Asked Questions section of her website, she stated that she would kill herself when she felt like it. So, as you can tell, many of the methods the church advocated were extreme and shocking. Critics of the church argued that if Corda genuinely wanted to spread her message effectively, it would have made more sense to just advocate for more moderate methods of population control and eco-friendliness. For example, contraception, education, and so on. Corda responded to these arguments by saying that it was too late for incremental change. According to The Being, the Earth was at a crisis point, and drastic measures had to be taken. Ecosystem, ecosystem, ecosystem is failing. Time for a quick break. Whether I'm lounging at home or on the beach, I want to feel comfortable and confident. I use Adormy.com to get affordable, high-quality lingerie, bras, and swimwear. Their products are designed by women for all women. They have hundreds of styles that flatter and support. Adormy is making shopping a much more pleasant experience for women. Just visit AdoreMe.com and choose from perfectly fitted t-shirt bras, push-ups, bralettes, and swimwear. Whether you prefer full support one pieces or strappy bikinis, you're bound to find your perfect beach day suit. I love sporting my Jocelyn high-waisted bikini to the beach. Adore Me has sold over 1 million bras for good reason. They're the perfect blend of comfort and style at a price you can afford. For a limited time, it's the Adore Me Spring Sale. Sets start at just $24.95 at adoreme.com slash cults. That's up to 50% off regular price. Plus, there's no risk or return lines. Shipping and exchanges are always free. And every bra comes with a free matching panty. That's adoreme.com slash cults. Adoreme.com slash cults. Now... Let's get back to the story. So up until now, we've been laying out the mission and message of the Church of Euthanasia in a cohesive and condensed way so as to clearly distill what the group's primary motives were. However, it's worth noting that Corda's interviews, essays, and sermons were wildly rambling, jumping from topic to topic, often contradicting themselves and expressing mistrust and paranoia toward just about every modern or mainstream institution. Additionally, on the church's website, Corda insisted that she was still in contact with the alien being 
and she said she received messages via, quote, psychic channeling, i.e. voices in my head, unquote. She also believed that the agricultural phenomenon of crop circles were signs that the being and other aliens were trying to communicate with her. It's impossible to definitively say whether Corda suffered from any atypical mental conditions, solely based on her writings and interviews, but according to the National Institute of Mental Health, paranoia, scattered thoughts, delusions of grandeur, and taking instructions from inner voices are common symptoms of several different psychiatric diseases, including manic bipolar disorder, delusional disorder, and paranoid schizophrenia. It's possible that Corda suffered, or still suffers, from some of these symptoms. The church showed up to a variety of public activism events in the Boston area. However, its members were often asked to leave when the public was offended by their obscene props and signs. One such event the church attended was Boston's first, and last, Population Awareness Day event, hosted on September 10, 1994, at Boston Common by environmental groups such as the Sierra Club and Clean Water Action. At this event, about a dozen Church of Euthanasia members, led by Corda, marched through the common with props that included a stick top with a baby doll covered in blood, a giant morning after pill, and a representation of the being, which was a vertical plastic cylinder with eye holes and multiple smaller perpendicular cylinders sticking out of the bottom, all placed on a makeshift parade float. In the issue of the church's e-magazine that was released in October 1994, immediately following the Population Awareness Day event, Corda insisted that the plastic representation of the being was in fact the literal alien, which had, quote, made a rare appearance for this gala event, end quote. For about an hour, the group shouted their typical Save the Planet, Kill Yourself slogan and performed a reading of facts about the risks of overpopulation. They were then asked to leave by organizers. The whole episode was emblematic of the Dada movement's influence on the group. Dadaist performers did not typically have the goal of going along with mainstream society. They wanted to shock people and to disrupt the norm through outlandish and abnormal statements. The absurd props that the church brought to the Population Awareness Day achieved this in spades. Another such event was the Boston First Night Parade, a popular annual family-friendly event held on January 1, 1995. Members brought an armchair-sized sculpture dubbed the Ark of Materialism, which featured a carnivorous baby trapped inside a television and a styrofoam head crowned with nails. They also brought the meat stick, a full-size wooden cross with a blood-covered stuffed toy rabbit, several dried fish, and a giant slab of fresh meat nailed to it, and signs bearing slogans like Eat People, Not Animals, and Prevent AIDS, Aim for the Chin. They were asked to leave on the grounds that there were children present. Throughout the 90s, Corda used stunts like these to build awareness of the church in the Boston area. The Church of Euthanasia was largely considered to be an odd but harmless fixture in the city, and people began to expect church members to show up at public rallies and events. It was around this time in 1995 that the church was also asked to leave their longtime meeting place by the building's landlord. After that, in-person meetings were relatively happenstance and were held in public spaces, such as parks, or wherever and whenever the church was planning to hold a protest or stunt. Corda often expressed pride when the church was asked to leave events. Given that her goal was to build public awareness, that seems like a contradictory reaction. Well, not necessarily. In Corda's view, the church was most effective when it disrupted conventional proceedings. Throughout her life, she had despised conformity, had experienced exclusion from her mainstream peers, and had even felt unwelcome in niche communities such as those involved with the Provincetown drag show scene. So it was probably empowering and validating to lead a group that thumbed its nose at society and took pride in rejection. Essentially, being on the outside of society was hard, but being on the outside of society with other like-minded individuals wasn't quite so bad. By the spring of 1995, the church found itself having to address a decidedly mainstream concern, its tax status. Church members themselves were only required to contribute a $10 lifetime fee, 
The majority of the church's funding came from the sales of novelty buttons and bumper stickers, bearing the church's classic Save the Planet, Kill Yourself motto, as well as slogans like Eat People, Not Animals, God is Coming, Stick Out Your Tongue, Don't Blame Me, I'm a Parasite, and Driving Drunk, Take Off Your Seatbelt. The church had sold more than 80,000 of these items through its website by 1995 and rented a booth at the National Stationery Show, successfully selling its products to a number of distributors. Of course, at the trade show, Corda did not miss the opportunity to stage a demonstration. She brought a 10-foot-wide Save the Planet, Kill Yourself sticker laid over a panoramic photo of a cemetery blasted her techno CDs, and accosted passers-by to pitch the church's ideals to them. In April of 1995, the federal government requested proof that the church was a legitimate organization in the form of pamphlets, brochures, literature, newsletters, and other materials. Corda was happy to send back materials on the church's four pillars and foundational principles, However, the government was unconvinced, and the church's bid to be recognized as a religious organization was rejected again in May 1995. Ultimately, the United States government offered a compromise. The church would never be classified as a religious organization or private foundation, but it could be declared a public charity and an educational foundation. Sales of stickers, buttons, and so forth would be considered fundraising, and the church could continue to call itself a church. But from the IRS's perspective, its primary activity was the dissemination of information, not religious ideals. Corda was only too happy to make that deal. And on June 14, 1995, the church's tax-exempt status was finally solidified. With the church's finances in a stable place, and a small but dedicated local following, Corda now began to look ahead at how her group could grow out of the constraints of Massachusetts and increase its presence in the rest of the country, possibly even the world. Next week, we'll go into more depth about the practices of Corda and the Church of Euthanasia and the types of publicity stunts the group used to attempt to garner attention and recognition on a larger scale. We'll also discuss who the members were and the reasons they joined, the pro-suicide messaging that led to at least one person taking her own life, and whether or not the church actually qualifies as a cult. Thanks again for tuning into Cults. If you want to listen to any previous episodes of Cults, you can find them on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify, or on our website, parcast.com, spelled P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com. If you like what you hear, please leave a five-star review or tell us what you think on social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram as at Parcast and Twitter at Parcast Network. It seems simple, but it really helps our show. Join us next Tuesday as we continue delving into the psychology behind the Church of Euthanasia. Cults was created by Max Cutler and is a production of Cutler Media and is part of the Parcast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by Russell Nash, with production assistance by Ron Shapiro and Paul Mahler. Additional production assistance by Maggie Admire, Carly Madden, and Jeanette Manning. Cults is written by Reka Mohan and stars Greg Polson and Vanessa Richardson. And don't forget to check out the new podcast, Breach. Breach is not a podcast podcast, but just like on cults, they use in-depth research to tell a captivating story. Breach is a podcast that takes you inside the world's biggest hacks. They set out to answer questions about the hack of a huge American company and found themselves investigating a Russian conspiracy. Subscribe to Breach, B-R-E-A-C-H, in your podcast app right now.